Good evening, Commonwealth, and thanks for watching the Channel 2 News. I'm Ashley McDowell. Let's take a look at tonight's top stories. The CNMI is transitioning into a new vulnerability level in economic recovery. Also tonight, the House minority shares the governor's expense records with the public. And federal court has entered a default against IPI. We have the details. In sports, with bats and balls in the closet, take out rods and reels. Stay with us, these stories and more are next. Thank you for being here with us. For finding ways to keep things happening. For making things feel a lot better. Thank you. Energize, realize, feel so good just to be alive. Time's a gift, my time is free. I can spend it on you, you can spend it on me. I can say you'll be blown away with the change you see, you see me. And I feel alright, dance alright, put a little flavor in my life. Thank you for staying strong with us. And for us. Thank you for always connecting. For keeping us together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us that despite this distance, we are still better together. Dokumo Pacific. Better together. better internet plans with the strongest internet from Docomo Pacific. With whole home Wi-Fi, it's the better way to work, play, and surf at home with the fastest download and upload speeds in the CNMI. Your better internet comes with the free Plume Superpod for the strongest and safest Wi-Fi coverage throughout your home. Sign up today for as low as $50 a month and get a free smart tablet. Better value for your best connection. Because in everything we do, we are always better together. Alpha Day, Terwami, and Good Evening Commonwealth. Today is Monday, June 15, 2020. The CNMI is easing into economic recovery, entering into a new vulnerability level. The executive directive was signed by Governor Torres today, placing the CNMI into a community vulnerability level blue under the community focused economic recovery. Governor has also extended the declaration of state of public health emergency and significant emergency for another 30 days. So we're moving, lifting the, um, or moving rather, the curfew uh, of uh, up to midnight and then working a business uh, to open up to 11 o'clock. Um, and then having... Um, churches and other faith base uh, to go up to 50 percent occupancy um, and then increasing up to not more than 25 people in a single room. The level blue also states that bars can be open at 50 percent capacity. While it may be difficult to enforce social distancing at bars, CHCC CEO Esther Munia says it takes the community's cooperation. This is a community vulnerability um, I guess, uh, level, you know, move from um, yellow to blue. There's, it, 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 I want to emphasize the word community. You know, we have come to this level because of the community's efforts to continue to do what we've been asking them to do. And we're not stopping that. We're not stopping individuals from, from acting that way. You know, this is still a continuously, you know, uh, an effort from all the community members 
And um, where we're at now, I mean, you know, this is the success of the people and not so much us. We're not we're not waiting, you know, sitting on our desk waiting for our, the the numbers to to inc- you know to be um, you know looking at the level and saying, oh yeah, let's let's push this to level blue. We're not doing that. Um, it's really a community effort. I just want to emphasize that again, that it's, you know, for everyone to get out of this uh, threat is continuously doing what we're asking everyone to do. A temperature screening will be required at restaurants and bars for employees and patrons. Munoz says they are hoping to open up village-based COVID-19 testing starting next week. As of today, June 15th, the CNMI is still at 30 cumulative positive cases of COVID-19 with two deaths. The House Minority reveals all expense records related to Governor Ralph Torres. Sally Limas has the details. The House Minority has obtained thousands of pages of records relating to the governor's first class travel, official representation, reimbursements, executive security, and housing and utilities expenses that is now made public. Representative Tina Sablon says the House Minority continues to look into it at the urging of many constituents. We haven't stopped working on it, we haven't stopped reviewing, and you know, we, we do think it's important to provide the accountability and the transparency that the people we serve demand and deserve, and, and so the work is continuing. Sablon says they are expecting for more documents. The Secretary of Finance actually has not fully complied with the Open Government Act and we have been following up with him on records that we know the Department of Finance has that, that they have not yet turned over. So uh, some of these relate to specific travel records of the governor that uh, were, were missing at the time months ago that they were still working on locating in, in their files. Uh, there are also records related to his executive security and, and those expenses, payroll records, things, things of that nature associated with the, with the personal security detail. In a separate interview with the governor's press secretary, Kevin Bautista says the administration has been very transparent adhering to the House Minority's request regarding the Open Government Act. Referring to official representation, Bautista says the governor led all CNMI efforts on important federal legislation with the White House and members of the U.S. Congress. In 2018, the governor was required to go to meetings in Washington, D.C. and Hawaii for important bio 2 competition and uh, on other federal negotiations on both immigration law and the military. He invited members of Congress and other federal partners to Saipan for a true glimpse of what the Commonwealth is trying to do to improve the standard of living here in the seat of mine. So yes, travel was made, expenses were made, postings were held by the seat of my government. But they were done in the manner in the same way that state and territorial governments who have conversations with federal partners um, have done in the past. Bautista also addresses the other expense records. Mm-hmm. Regarding some of the other additional, regarding some of the other expenses in question um, that was arbitrarily picked in that Google Drive that they, they, that, they, um, that they apparently have all the time to do because they don't have to do anything about the COVID-19 response. In that Google Drive they talk about um, some of the expenses regarding the governor's um, utilities and, exp- and, and household. Um, we have to make this very clear, and this, and, and this is something where you can really tell this is very political, is the point that every governor is afforded the opportunity to live in the governor's house under seat in my law. There is no governor's house at the moment. The last governor to live in the governor's house was Governor One in that kind of about it. Governor Torres is now living in his own personal home, and... Given and given um, the given under what is provided under CMI law, utilities and expenses are provided are, are are properly accounted for. Bautista says the entire situation is frustrating. There are certain people in the legislature, in the minority, who are choosing to play for politics under a false veil because that's all they can do. They're choosing to not focus on solutions and that would actually help people, but with so divisiveness for the sake of their political end, because we know it's an even-numbered year, and at a time when our community is most in need of coming together, we know that here with the administration, we're doing our part, regardless of all the political attacks that are going on, we're going to do our part to ensure that pandemic unemployment assistance gets out in the hands of our residents. The documents now go to the proper stand committees of the House, who will perform a formal legislative investigation. Reporter for KSPN News, I'm Sally Lemis. 
IPI could soon be on the hook for millions of dollars in a human trafficking case that involved construction workers building the casino. Our Chris Nelson has more. Aaron Haligua and Bruce Berline represent seven workers who they say were victims of forced labor and human trafficking at the construction site of the casino. Haligua is a New York native who previously lived and worked in China and specializes in labor cases. As part of the discovery process, Judge Mona Manglonia ordered IPI to produce transcripts of evidence that was already in their possession, things like emails, WhatsApp messages, and WeChat messages that the legal team of Berline and Haligua wanted to examine. IPI was ordered to produce these and pay for a service that would help consolidate the messages, but they haven't done so. And on Friday, an exasperated judge ruled that the litigation will no longer go forward and that Imperial Pacific is now liable for damages. The entry of the default basically means that liability has been established. Right. So we have proven, you know, it's accepted as that we've proven our case and IPI is liable for the things that we have alleged. What's going to happen over the next two weeks is that we need to submit our damages. And so we need to put together evidence that will show how much the plaintiffs are entitled to um, that should be paid by IPI. And so in our case, where we're looking at the forced labor claim, as well as the injuries that they suffered, we're going to be seeking damages for the recruitment fees that they paid, uh, lost work opportunities resulting from their injuries, emotional distress that they suffered as a result of this, as well as asking for punitive damages. The total amount of damages are expected to be submitted within two weeks. Estimates are that with punitive damages tacked on, that number could be a few million dollars, but the plaintiffs aren't yet saying. Last week, IPI had money seized from local bank accounts by the court to help satisfy a judgment in another case against a, another former construction company. Estimates are that between $800,000 and $1 million was seized. So we'll put forward the evidence of what we think the damages are. Um, uh, IPI will have a chance to respond to that. And then there's a hearing set um, you know, to consider you know, both sides' arguments. Ultimately, in most default situations, the judge will be the ultimate decider of what the damages are. Thank you, Chris. A large structure fire happened on Friday evening in the lower base area at a building leased by DPL by Imperial Pacific. It was a big blaze that started on the northern part of the building in lower base and quickly spread south. Workers at the site told arriving firefighters that they had locked up the area around 4 p.m. CNMI Fire Department says they got a call just before 5 p.m. on Friday that trash was on fire. They responded. The three-story structure was the Formant Garment Factory of Tan Holdings and was returned to public lands a number of years ago. DPL rented the building out to Imperial Pacific. Derek Gersande of the fire department says the blaze was originally reported as a trash fire and that it spread to the warehouse. Fire personnel had to break a padlock to gain access. Gersande says the third floor of the warehouse contained a lot of ducting and insulation, while the second floor had plywood and metal. DPL today said the building was insured. Fire does not yet know how the blaze started and that is still under investigation. Fire says it took over 12 hours to contain the blaze. Coming up, representatives from the Department of Labor provide more information on the PUA application process. More on this after the break. Mom, are you sure? What about the shutters? And do you have your medicine? Don't worry about us, love, okay? You take good care of yourself. I'm in love. Yeah, sorry. The power went out, so I have to light up all the candles. Yeah. Yes, baby, yeah. I'm just glad our home phone's working and we're able to contact you. Winnegi PHI Pharmacy in Gofadahi, Tihinim Lomu. Our complete line of pharmaceuticals and lowest prices ensure you get the treatment that you deserve. 
Our compassionate, friendly, multilingual staff will take the time to get to know you, explain your medications to you, and answer any questions that you may have. Nere eyor sumaye ukalwere sven, kuchu weyor safeye emal ebalisiu klalyam wire. Inumin ng inyong gamot, ayon sa nereseta ng inyong doktor, at alin sunod sa bili ng inyong pharmaceutical. We accept most insurance, but in case you don't have coverage, we offer cost-effective generic drugs. PHI Pharmacy, your lifelong partner in health. PHI, the pharmacy you can trust. Mom, are you sure? What about the shutters? And do you have your medicine? Don't worry about us, love, okay? You take good care of yourself. I'm in love. Yeah, sorry. The power went out, so I had to light a cold candle. Yeah. Yes, baby, yeah. yeah. I'm just glad our home phone's working and we're able to contact you. Welcome back to the Channel 2 News. The CNMI Department of Labor held a virtual conference this morning for the PUA FPUC program. Here are some of the highlights. The CNMI Department of Labor will be accepting applications for the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance and Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program starting this Wednesday, June 17th. DOL has broken down the program into two phases. Phase one is business registration. This is done through the site HireMiranas.com. You need to identify um, a representative type, which is the direct representative of the organization. Employer identification, which is the federal employer ID number or the federal tax ID number. Social security number for the self-employed and co-providers. The company information, mailing address, the NACIS code, number of employees type of employer, whether it's private sector, government agency, or federal government, international foreign government, nonprofit, education, staff agencies, and state universities. The second part of phase one is to register the affected employees. This is also done through HireMarianas.com. After signing in um, into Hire Marianas, you're going to see on the left hand side several tabs. One of them is going to say services for employers. Under there, look for unemployment services. A smaller pop up window will come up saying pandemic separation notice. Click on that. When you click on that, this section will open up. In the middle of that page, um, the hyperlink in blue stated, uh, which states add a new separation notice. Click on there to start uh, entering your employee information. This window uploads. So here you would enter in all your individual employees that were affected. Um, everything from their first name, last name, social security number, date of separation, date of hire, uh, date last worked, recall date. Below that section, you're going to see a separation reason with an asterisk, the reason for separation. So select part-time or reduced hours if that was what the employee initially experienced during their employment as it relates to pandemic. Um, some were laid off or furloughed. So you would go ahead and input disaster, pandemic, lack of work or layoff. Phase two is the employee application process. So during the registration section, there's going to be a, quite a few things that they have to have um, on hand. Their demographic information, when they were born, their gender and name, residential address and mailing address, phone numbers. Um, this could also be a section where they would enter their neighbor's phone if that's, that's the best number for them. Not everybody has a cell phone, and that's fine. Um, put in the best number that you know they can get to that we can call to reach them preferred notification method. Do they want their written notice via email, text, or from Hire Marianas? And that's sent in internally. Their citizenship. Disability. Um, are they receiving any benefits from disability? Social security income, um, SSDI, so on and so forth. 
The program also requests for child support deductions if they have any outstanding um, debts to for their children. Their educational background, employment. Also included is your employment status. That is your current uh, job if you or your most recent job that you were terminated from. Um, military service, payment information, taxable options. The benefits do need to be um, taxed, whether or not you want it now or when you file your tax is another option for you to select. Um, employment history. This is where you would add all the employers that you have worked for, whether it be at um, three stores or one store, you would add um, all the employments that you were affected during this pandemic. And then also, of course, your pension and retirement information. Any questions regarding the PUA application process can be answered through one of the phone numbers on your screen. The entire webinar can be found on Facebook through the CNMI Office of the Governor. One representative in the CNMI House offers his office for those applying for the federal assistance. Take a listen. Representative Lewis John Kostrew is opening his office to applicants for the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance and Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation. For the entire period that the application process is open from tomorrow, or excuse me, Wednesday to um, Wednesday to uh, the end of the application process, which is in late December, um, every Tuesday and Wednesday we're offering for those who need help with uh, copying their documents or digitizing their documents, you know, to come on up to the office and um, our staff can can assist you. Kostru says those interested may call his office and his staff will set up a schedule to assure social distancing. I know that definitely there's some confusion that's happened early since, uh, the, since we put the news out um, in regards to what assistance we're giving. So the main thing that our office is providing is that you need to, it's primarily just to get your documents ready. Kostra assures the community that all original copies will be given back and no information will be kept or shared. Reporter for KSPN News, I'm Sally Lemis. Thank you, Sally. All right, coming up in the sports report, the story of the fish that did not get away. Are with you at times when you need us most you can count on us to be there when you need someone to talk to when you need to stay informed when you need to brighten your day when you need to stay connected we are here keeping our promise that while the world is changing we keep working so you can keep connecting we are your docomo pacific family and we are here to help Green sea turtles and hawksbill turtles call the Mariana Islands home. They are an important part of the marine ecosystem. They are under threat and they are protected under CNMI law. Keep plastic out of the ocean. Keep vehicles off the beach. Use the sea turtle stranding hotline if you see poaching activities or if you see a turtle in trouble. Call 287-8537 and save a turtle.
Point of sports fans, no baseball, no basketball, no soccer. Just fishing these days. Take the bait. Get hooked. Inside or outside the lagoon, there's a place for fishermen of all kinds. One popular type, night fishing in the lagoon. Mark Rages shows off his catch after a night on the water. We're almost full. Uh, we went uh, overnight bottom fishing. Yeah. Well, what kind of fish you guys caught? Uh, different kinds, shallow bottom and deep bottom fish, you know, assorted. Uh, yeah, <laughs> mafuti. You know, those kind of kari kari, yeah. Mark is more of a recreational fisherman than a commercial one, but you know how it is. You know, just the family and, yeah, family and maybe make some money on the side if, you know, there's left over and, yeah. <laughs> Our favorite fish Facebook photo of the week, courtesy of George Moses. He never met an Onaga that he didn't like. The biggest, baddest fishing tournament of all, the Saipan Fishermen's Association annual billfish derby, usually held in late July, is being hoped for. Fishermen, government officials, everybody wants it to happen, and it will, if certain procedures are taken and sign-offs are obtained. It's a work in progress now. Our fishing flashback takes us back to 2004, when a typhoon forced the derby to be postponed until September. That's the year 10 minutes was worth $10,000. The 20th annual Saipan International Fishing Derby saw a record number of boats entering. Some of them had teeth, others had clever names, and some of them used lots of gas, hundreds of dollars of gas, all hoping to bring back the big prize, the largest marlin, but some were happy with what they got. Obviously, you're not impressed with that big fish. Absolutely this is not. bigger than that fish in our heart, man. Are you kidding me? Look at the size. <laughs> if it were for no fish like this, there wouldn't be big fish like that. <laughs> that's the, huh? that's the it's, it's fish like that that make that guy a winner. Yes, hey, and that's why we should get the prize. <laughs> By the end of the first day, Tony Sablon was on top of the leaderboard with a 220-pound marlin. Uh, we were resting outside Managaha, just about three miles outside the reef. We were resting because too hot. And then as soon as we moved, not even 100 feet away from, from there where we parked, we got him. And then soon as, how long does it take to bring him in? Uh, maybe an hour. One hour. You think it's going to be big enough to uh, win? I hope so. <laughs> Let's hope there's one more day to go. Yeah. Win Wa from Guam had a nice 160 pound marlin on Saturday. He was already looking forward to Sunday. We're going to do it again tomorrow. Over Hopefully here. bigger than that. <laughs> On Sunday, Team Palau, captained by Johnson Shipwright, brought in a 379-pound marlin at 445. They were just 75 minutes away from winning the $10,000 prize. Then I went up a uh, bunch of and uh, just stay all over there. And, uh, I got a luck over there, so I too. Right up by Banzai. Uh, what time did you get that? I got him about uh, like around 1 o'clock. One hour and 25 minutes, five. Out there. Tell us what happened. It's the first time I've been on a derby and I was with the Masters, Joe and Elisa. Joe and Elisa, champions from Palau. All right. You got one hour to go. Uh, you think you got it in the bag? You still a little nervous? Still a little nervous, but I bet I win. So. People were lining up, watching the final boats coming in to see if anyone could beat that. And then, just 10 minutes before the deadline, A 519-pound marlin, that's the grand prize winner. In his first appearance in the Saipan Derby, Huynh Hua from Guam took it, earning it too, having to bring the monster up by hand. I'm a Marpi uh, um, bank, and uh, it took us about two and a half hours to get in. He kind of uh, dived down the bottom and uh, kind of drowned, so we had to handline it up. Handline? We had to handline it up, but it come up tail first. Wow. <laughs> so, is, that, is that the biggest marlin you've ever caught? Uh, that's the biggest one I've ever caught. Uh -huh. What are you going to do with the money that you want? $10,000? Uh, I'm going to split with my crew. <laughs> right. Here's the wind up and the pitch. I don't believe what I just saw. 
Let's roll at Gold's Gym Saipan with group exercise for every body. Total Resistant Exercise, or TRX, helps develop your core and improve strength. And Zumba toning is probably the funnest way to get fit. The Shake Cafe is a great place to stop by for meal replacement or supplements. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Yeah, it was hot today, 90, the temperature below 80, but it's the heat index that counts, and it was 107. That's the highest of 2020. What a year we're having. 63% humidity, tomorrow partly cloudy, isolated showers, east winds 10 to 15 miles an hour, high 90, low 80, seas 3 to 5 feet, sunrise 547, low tide at 1055 in the morning, uh, high tide 504 and sunset at 648. That's it. New sports and weather. Thank you for watching. See you back here on Wednesday evening.